dear and respected slava sisak dr benny matthew and father dr josh george vice principals professor pj thomas head of the department mr amal thomas centenary special talk coordinator professor joseph job centenary programs general coordinator former teachers invited girls dear teachers other dignitaries and my dear students warm greetings to you all i feel delighted to welcome everyone to this centenary special talk organized by the department of english st bergmans autonomous college chennai kerala india i would like to congratulate the department of english on hosting this lecture as part of the centenary celebrations of the college by inviting an eminent scholar sisak before moving to my official task let me introduce st bergmans college st st bergmans college established in 1922 st bergmans college is a is a government aided autonomous college affiliated to mahatma gandhi university kottayam kerala over these years it has grown up to grown up gradually and steadily with 17 departments 18 ug programs and 19 pg programs and 10 with 10 research departments it's my pr proud privilege to welcome slavoj sisak formally to this to the college i am sure this slovenian lakanian hegelian contemporary dialectician par excellence will be introduced by the department to the audience but one thing i should say that he is someone who keeps his eyes wide open to the problems and pandemics of the day let me take this opportunity to thank sizak for his generosity in accepting our invitation and giving this centenary special lecture on the material existence of ideology on behalf of the bergmans community i welcome you to this program i cordially welcome all the dignitaries vice principals of the college dr benny matthew and father jos george former professors heads of the departments other teacher teachers from other colleges and all the participants i would like to express my gratitude towards all who are sincerely who sincerely contributed to this event my special thanks to professor pj thomas the head of the department and mr amal thomas the coordinator of this event i wholeheartedly welcome you all once again to this program i remain thank you thank you father leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality i invite professor pj thomas head of the department of english to introduce the speaker over to you sir thank you can you hear me am i audible yes sir thank you okay. sir oh, okay big hello to all of you and thank you for joining in spite of the raging pandemic and the terrible consequences uh, which surround us um i don't need to tell you how happy i am today to take up this responsibility challenging the responsibility of introducing uh, professor slavo isisek i know there are many isisek experts fans and scholars of isisek and therefore this introduction may be mere surplus if not mere excess so there i will therefore i will be very brief i'm happy um to inform you that around uh, 1800 people have registered for this event and uh, with all these people it looks like a virtual ipl cricket stadium so these are scholars who have joined from all over india and beyond from mexico of the philippines peru us and uh, many other places it's a fitting tribute to the superhuman genius uh, the celebrity 
philosopher, cultural critic, prolific author, radical leftist, and world's most dangerous and controversial thinker, and highly creative pessimist, Professor Slavoj Žižek. It is Terry Gulten who said about uh, Slavoj that the most formidable, brilliant exponent of psychoanalysis, indeed of cultural theory in general, to have emerged in Europe for decades. Martin Heidegger once said, what was Aristotle's life? Well, the answer lies in a single sentence. He was born, he thought, he died, and all the rest is pure anecdote. Professor Sisak did a little more. He also made others think. Philosophy begins, Sisak says always, the moment we do not simply accept what exists as given. A distinctive feature of Sisak's writing and speech is his determination to be pro provocative, to open up discussion and to stimulate new work rather than to be reductively definitive. His work traverses the fields of philosophy, psychoanalysis, theology, history, political theory, film, popular culture, literature, and even jokes. His unique intellectual legacy is his attempt to bring together Hegel, Marx, and Lacan, and make them interrogate and inform each other, in which he achieved huge success. He has authored numerous books starting from the sublime object of ideology in 1981 to Slavoj Zizek, a left that dares to speak his time, pandemic COVID-19 shakes, uh, shakes the West in 2020. He has two doctorates, one from the University of Ljubljana in French structuralism and another from Sisek is professor and researcher at the Department of Philosophy of the University of Ljubljana, international director of Burbeck Institute for the Humanities at the University of London, and a visiting professor to many universities globally. On a personal note, let me reminisce my rare opportunity of listening to him in Kochi in 2010, when he came for the Kochi Life Festival, and recently in 2018 at the Burbeck Institute in London. I'm deeply grateful to Professor Cizek for accepting our invitation to deliver this historic centenary special lecture of St. Berkman's College on the topic on the material existence of ideology. So please join me in welcoming the state philosopher who dirties his hands in fighting for a different state and a radical left who dares to speak his time. Thank you all and over to Professor Cizek. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. I am grateful to you to open up this space to me. And I must say, when you mentioned that this, because there are many who are listening to us, it's like a cricket game here, not only the British, but you also in India, you have a privilege over us. You obviously understand cricket. I was once sitting there for two hours and didn't understand anything. So there are things that I absolutely don't understand. I envy you for understanding cricket. Seriously, I'm honored to be here. I have a wonderful memory of visiting Kerala and I just hope when this horror will be over that some kind of new normality will be established and to visit your wonderful place again. So let me begin. Today we live in a strange era. Religious and national fundamentalisms are rising at the same time that cynical disbelief is rising. In such a moment, we should make a step back and instead of just analyzing the content of today's ideologies, we should focus on their more formal features. For example, what do we mean when we say that we believe or we don't believe in an ideology? Today, more there are beliefs which function socially, even if no one really believes. 
I remember from my youth in the socialist Yugoslavia, the official ideology of self-management socialism was not taken seriously even by the apparatchiks. And in this way, it functioned perfectly. The apparatchiks got in panic when someone took the official ideology seriously. This was for them the first step towards becoming a dissident. But this didn't mean that individuals simply didn't believe. They acted as if they believed and this was what mattered. They believe in and through their activity. What do I mean by this? Let me mention again a joke which probably most of you know. I used it uh, about 20 times, I think, in my writings, but it renders perfectly what I want to say. A joke about the great uh, quantum physics scientist, Niels Bohr, who had above the entrance to his house a horseshoe. In Europe, a superstitious sign which allegedly prevents evil spirits entering his house. And a friend who visited him said, but aren't you a scientist? Why do you have this superstitious item there? As a scientist, you should know that this doesn't work. And Bohr, Bohr answered, I know as a scientist that it doesn't, uh, it, I, I know as a scientist, I don't believe in it, but I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. That's ideology today. Ideologies work, you don't have to believe in them. You just practice them. That's what Marx meant by commodity fetishism. You are not an idiot. You don't believe that commodities or money are something magic, but you act in your practice as if you believe in it. So when somebody mocks his nation, her nation, ideology, whatever, even religion, this doesn't mean he, da, he or she or they don't believe in it. Uh, often, not taking your ideology seriously is a perfect way for this ideology to function. The next feature of ideology is what I take the risk to call the ideological unconscious. An ideological edifice implies and relies on a set of claims which are necessary for its functioning, but which should not be stated publicly. Let me take a surprising example. In the fall of 2006, Sheikh Taj Din Al Hilali, Australia's most senior Muslim cleric, caused a scandal when, after a group of Muslim men, had been jailed for gang rape, he said, quote, if you take an uncovered meat and place it outside on the street and the cats come and eat it, whose fault is it? The cats or the uncovered meat? The uncovered meat is the problem, end of quote. The scandalous nature of this comparison between a woman who is not veiled and raw uncovered meat distracted attention from another more surprising premise underlying this scandalous, of course, argument. If women are held responsible for the sexual conduct of men, does this not imply that men are totally helpless when faced with what they perceive as a sexual provocation, that they are simply unable to resist it? that they are totally enslaved to their sexual hunger, precisely like a cat when it sees raw meat. So in contrast to this presumption of the complete lack of male responsibility for their own sexual conduct, the emphasis on public female eroticism in the West relies on the premise that men are capable of sexual restraint, that they are not blind slaves of their, of their sexual drives. My point here is that the statement of uh, this shake is 
extremely brutal, anti-feminist, and so on and so on. But you see what I'm aiming at. If you go a little bit deeper, you find, I'm not saying feminism, but you find something very strange. You find that women are considered guilty for exposing themselves as raw meat, Guilty because they can control themselves. They are ethical subjects. We men are like cats or dogs. I see meat off, I can only jump. We find many surprises like this in ideology. The third feature I want to emphasize is the title of my talk, The Material Existence of Ideology. In his classical text on ideological state apparatuses, Louis Altisset, makes the point about the material support of ideology. Military, legal, and ideological apparatuses, institutional and educational machines, and so on, claiming that this material support of ideology was ignored by Marxists from Marx onwards. For traditional Marxists, materialism means that ideology is grounded in the extra ideological material process of social reproduction. What they ignore is the proper material existence of ideology in ideological state apparatuses, in a complex institutional network of practices and rituals. However, I think that together with Jacques Lacan, we should make here a step further from Althusser. The real that sustains an ideology is ultimately spectral, virtual. Althusser himself knew that ideology, I quote from Althusser, is silently buttressed by the existence and presence of the public armed physical force that it is not fully visible or actively employed, that it very often intervenes only intermittently or remains hidden and invisible, all this is simply one further form of its existence and action. One had to make a show of one's force so as not to have to make use of it. It is sufficient to deploy one's military force to achieve by intimidation results that would normally have been achieved by sending it into action. One's force so as not to have to make use of it. When threats of brute force or the force of law subject the actors in a given situation to obvious pressure, there is no longer any need to make a show of this force. There are, there may be more One makes a show of force so as not to have to make use of it. Then one does not make a show of one's force so as not to have to make use of it. First, we negate the direct use of force by replacing it with a mere show of force, say, in a tense situation in which authorities expect forceful popular demonstrations, they decide to parade columns of tanks through the popular quarters of a city, expecting that this show of readiness to defend public order at any price will dissuade the protesters. Then there is no show of force and the authorities expect that this absence will have an even more forceful deterring effect than the open display of force. Since the protesters know that there is a police or military force ready to confront them, its very absence, invisibility, makes it all the more ominous and omnipotent. For example, is Israel not doing this for years? It gives hints that it has nuclear weapons, but Israel never admits it publicly. 
Nuclear weapons are an exemplary case of a violence which works as a potential threat. The, its actual use would have meant a total destruction of all parties. Another example, when we do something wrong and expect our figure of authority to explode in fury and shout at us, if this figure does not explode, but remains cold and calm, the effect can be even more threatening, since there is always something of the release of attention in the open explosion of fury. This virtual real is also operative in financial gold reserves. Uh, this little piece of the real, either the armed force or gold reserve, can remain in the background. It can perform its function even without being used. It can perform its function even if it doesn't exist at all. It is enough that people believe that there are armed forces hidden in the background or gold reserves in an inaccessible bank vault. The effect is here. The real in the background, which serves as the ultimate guarantee and support of the public power, is a spectral entity. It not only doesn't need to exist in reality, if it appears and directly intervenes in reality, it risks losing its power, since, as Jacques Lacan made it clear, omnipotence in French, toute puissance, necessarily reverts into toute en puissance, all in potency. A father who is perceived as omnipotent can only sustain this position if his potency, power, remains forever potential, a threat which is never actualized. The full use of force, painful as it can be, makes it part of reality and as such, by definition, limited. Uh, if a regime gets involved in an open warfare against its own population, it risks losing not only the minimum of legitimacy, but the very strength of its power. And the same goes for gold reserves. Imagine they all get poisoned by strong radiation and thus of no physical use. If people continue to accept them as a point of reference, nothing would have changed. This, I think, is what Althusser ignores, that the real that sustains an ideology is ultimately virtual. There is another fourth feature of ideology and its prohibitions. I want to illustrate it by the loss of Manu. You know it better than me, the ancient Indian text, which is one of the exemplary works of ideology, maybe the most exemplary in the entire history of humanity. The loss of Manu focuses on everyday practices, on the immediate materiality of ideology, how, what, where, with whom, when, we eat, defecate, have sex, walk, enter a building, work, make war, and so on and so on. Here, the text uses a complex panoply of tricks, displacements, and compromises, whose basic formula is that of universality with exceptions. In principle, yes, this is the rule, but there are exceptions. The loss of Manu demonstrates a breathtaking ingenuity in accomplishing this task, with examples often coming dangerously close to the ridiculous. For example, priests should not study, should study the Veda, not trade. In extremity, however, a priest can engage in trade, but he is not allowed to trade in certain things like sesame seed. If he does it, 
he can only do it in certain circumstances. Finally, if he does it in the wrong circumstances, he will be reborn as a worm in dog shit. Is the structure here not exactly the same as that of the famous Jewish joke on the marriage mediator who reinterprets every deficiency of the bride to be as a positive asset? She is poor, so she will know how to handle the family man money making most of it. She is ugly, so the husband will not have to worry that she will cheat on him. She stutters, so she will keep quiet and not annoy the husband with <coughs> incessant prattle. And so on, till the final. She really stinks, then the mediator explodes. So what do you want her? To be perfect without any failure? The general formula of this procedure is to state a general rule to which the whole of subsequent debate constitutes nothing but a series of increasingly specific exceptions. A specific injunction is stronger than a general one. In other words, the great lesson of the laws of Manu is that the true regulating power of the law does not reside in its direct prohibitions in the division of our acts into permitted and prohibited, but in regulating the very violation of prohibitions. The law silently accepts that the basic prohibitions are violated, or even discreetly solicits us to violate them. And then once we find ourselves in this position of guilt, it tells us how to reconcile the violation of the law by a way of violating the prohibition in a regulated way. This is, I think, the constitutive, let me use this term problematic, maybe perversion of the law. Law never simply prohibits. It tells you between the lines how to violate this prohibition and how under certain conditions this violation can be tolerated. That's traditional ideology. Today, however, ideology no longer functions like that, I claim. A rupture is taking place in what philosophers call the ethical substance of our life. What do I mean by this? Every order of culture implies its obscene underground, what one is not allowed to talk about publicly. This, this space of the obscene operates at multiple levels, from rumors about dark side of the private life of political leaders and the use of dirty language and indecent insinuations, to cases which are much more innocent and as such even more crucial. Here is an extreme case of the prohibition of publicly stating the obvious. In the last years of his life, Deng Xiaoping, of, uh, officially retired, but everybody knew that he continued to pull the strings of power. When one of the high Chinese party apparatchiks, in an interview with a foreign journalist, referred to Deng as de facto leader of China, he was nonetheless accused of publicly disclosing a state secret and severely punished. So a state secret is not necessarily what only a few are allowed to know. It can also be something that everybody knows. Everybody except what Lacan calls the big other, the order of public appearance. One should not lose sight of what is so surprising about the rise of shameless obscenity of the so-called alternative right, new populist right, the obscenity well noted and analyzed by Angela Nagle in her wonderful book, Kill All Normies. Traditionally, shameless obscenity worked as subversive, as a, the undermining of domination as depriving the master of false dignity. 
I remember from my own youth how in 1960s, 70s, protesting students like to use obscene words, 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 or make obscene gestures to embarrass a figure of power. And so they claimed, denounce his, her hypocrisy. However, what we are getting today with the exploding public obscenity is not the disappearance of authority of master figures, but it's forceful reappearance. We are getting something unimaginable 10, 20 years ago, obscene masters. Should we link this rise of public obscenity? Just think of how Donald Trump was acting in public to the alleged abandonment of proof. Big media are telling us again and again that we live in a post-truth era and that this abandonment of truth in public discourse is the greatest threat to our democracy. <coughs> in the debate about the explosion of fake news in our media, liberal critics like to point out three events which combined continuously bring about what some people call the death of truth. First, it is the rise of religious and ethnic fundamentalisms, and it's obverse, stiff political correctness, which disavow rational argumentation and ruthlessly manipulate data to get their message through. Christian fundamentalists lie, lie for Jesus. Politically correct leftists obfuscate news which show their preferred victims in a bad sight, and so on. Then, there are the new digital media, which enable people to form communities defined by specific ideological interests. Communities where they can exchange news and opinions outside a unified public space and where conspiracies and similar theories can flourish without constraint. Finally, there is the legacy of postmodern deconstructionism and historicist relativism, which claims that there is no objective truth valid for all, that every truth relies on a specific horizon and is rooted in a subjective standpoint that depends on power relations. So that the greatest ideology is precisely the claim that we can step out of our historical limitation and look at things objectively. Critics of the death of truth opposed to historicist relativism, the idea that facts are out there, accessible to an objective, disinterested approach. So that we should distinguish between freedom, of opinions and freedom of facts. Liberals can thus comfortably occupy the privileged ground of truthfulness and dismiss both, both sides, alternative populist right and radical left. But I think problems begin with the last distinction. In some sense, there are alternate facts, not of course in the sense that some event did or did not happen. Holocaust happened. Data are a vast, but data are a vast and impenetrable domain. And we always approach the data from what hermeneutics calls a certain horizon of understanding, privileging some data and omitting others. All our histories are precisely that, stories, a combination of selected data into consistent narratives, not photographic reproduction of reality. For example, an anti-Semitic historian could easily write an overview of the role of the Jews in the social life of Germany in 1920s, pointing out how entire professions, lawyers, journalists, art critics, were numerically dominated by Jews. All the data 
could be more or less true, but clearly they are in the service of a lie. The most efficient lies are lies with truth, lies which only reproduce our factual data. Here I like to quote Jacques Lacan's paradoxical statement, if a husband accuses is or is obsessed by the fact that his wife is sleeping around with other men, his and is jealous of it, his jealousy is pathological, even if his wife is really doing it. So you see, uh, applied to anti-Semitism or racism, of course, if you accuse some group in a racist way of crimes, hideous behavior, it's up to a point always true. But nonetheless, generally, it's a lie. In the case of, for example, anti-Semitism, it's clear why it's a lie. Because you put partial truth in the service of your general lie, which is, why do you need to discriminate others to assert your identity? The lie is there. So again, the most dangerous lying, ideological lying, is lying which doesn't simply lie at the level of facts, but uses real data, but in a, such a manipulated, manipulated way. There is nothing relativist in the fact that human history is always told from a certain standpoint. The difficult thing is to show how this interested standpoints are not ultimately all equally true. Some are more truthful than others. For example, if one tells the story of Nazi Germany from the standpoint of the suffering of those oppressed by it, that is to say, if we are led in our telling by an interest in universal human emancipation, this is not just a matter of different subjective standpoint. All subjective interests are not the same, not only because some are ethically preferable to others, but because subjective interests do not stand outside social reality. They are themselves moments of social reality formed by active or passive participants in social processes. There is an even greater problem with the underlying premise of those who proclaim the death of truth. They talk as if once before, say till 1980s or 90s, in spite of all manipulations and distortions, truth did somehow prevail, and that the death of truth is a recent phenomenon. But a quick overview tells us that this was not the case. How many violations of human rights, <coughs> sorry, and how many humanitarian catastrophes remained invisible from Vietnam War to the invasion of Iraq? Just remember the times of Reagan, Nixon, Bush. The difference was not that the past was more truthful, but that ideological hegemony was much stronger, so that instead of today's greater mixture of local truths, one truth, or rather one big lie, basically prevailed, prevailed. In the West, this was the liberal democratic truth with the leftist or rightist spin, and in the East, the communist truth in the uh, communist bloc. What is happening today is that with the populist wave which unsettled the political establishment, the truth which served as ideological foundation is also falling apart. And the ultimate reason for this disintegration is not the rise of postmodern relativism, but the failure of the ruling establishment, which is no longer able to maintain its ideological hegemony. Does this mean? that the only honest position is postmodern relativism, which claims that we should accept the mixture of lies and small truth as our reality. 
that every big truth is a lie. Definitely not. What it means is that there is no return to the old ideological hegemony. The only way to return to truth is to reconstruct it from a position engaged in universal emancipation. The paradox to be accepted is that universal truth and partiality do not exclude each other. In our social life, universal truth is accessible only to those who are engaged in the struggle for emancipation, not to those who try to maintain an objective in the indifference. There are not only true data and false data. There are also true and false subjective standpoints, since these standpoints themselves are part of data, of social reality. The obscene public space that is emerging today thus changes the way the opposition between appearance and rumor or obscene background works. It is not that appearances no longer matter, since obscenity reigns directly. It is rather that spreading obscene rumors or acting obscenely paradoxically sustains the appearance of power. A political leader today can act in undignified ways, make obscene gestures, and so on. But all this only strengthens his position as a master. Donald Trump surprised us again and again with how far he, he uh, was willing to go with his vulgar obscenities. Let me mention one extreme case. Trump's attacks on the ex-FBI law lawyer, Lisa Page, at the Minneapolis rally in October 2019. He, I was shocked to see this, he performed a mock reenactment of her phone, of her phone comments, of her phone exchange with Mr. Zrock her ex-lover, as though the couple were in the middle of a sexual act. He, Donald Trump, was imitating her orgasmic throes. Lisa Page understandably exploded with rage. But the same story seems to repeat itself. Trump survives again and again what his enemies consider to be the final straw that should destroy him. So when we are shocked by what some politician, politicians like Trump or Modi say, we explode usually in critical rage. How is this possible? It is unacceptable and then outrageous. However, by way of reacting in this way, we miss the point, the big other the moral authority we are addressing and relying on is no longer here. Our complaint is pointless. There is no one listening to it. When there was a war in Bosnia almost three decades ago, I remember the reports on the suicides of the raped women there. They survived the rape. What kept them alive was the conviction that they must live to tell their story to their community. But it often happened that there was nobody in their community ready to listen to them. They were viewed with suspicion, uh, uh, treated as participating in and co-responsible for their humiliation. And this experience drove them to suicide. And I think something similar awaits those who explode in rage about today's political obscenities. The horror is that there is no moral authority to which we can appeal for being, for our rage, with our rage, no higher agency of judgment. Ideology is thus not just an explicitly formulated edifice of ideas and ideals, 
ideology includes how this edifice functions in our daily lives and institutions. Look at how ideology is at work in our dealing with the COVID pandemic. The predominant form of thinking pandemic is a combination of well-known motives. In pandemic, not only our social and economic tensions exploded, the pandemic also reminded us that we are part of nature, not its center. So we have to change our way of life, limit our individualism, develop new solidarity and accept our modest place in the life on our earth. Or as Judith Butler put it, quote, an inhabitable world for humans depends on a flourishing earth that does not have humans at its center. We oppose environmental toxins, not only so that we humans can live and breathe without fear of being poisoned, but also because the water and the air must have lives that are not centered on our own. As we dismantle the rigid forms of individuality in these interconnected times, we can imagine the smaller part that human worlds must play on this earth, whose regeneration we depend upon, and which in turn depends or upon our smaller and mindful role." End of quote. But is it not too simple to insist that the water and the air must have lives that are not centered on our own. That is to say that we have to adopt a more modest role on the earth. Is it not that global warming and other ecological threats demand of us collective interventions into our environment, which will be incredibly powerful, direct interventions into the fragile balance of forms of life. When we say that the rise of average temperature has to be kept below two degrees Celsius, we talk and try to act as general managers of life on Earth, not as a modest species. The regeneration of the Earth obviously does not depend upon our smaller role. It depends upon our gigantic role, which is the truth beneath all the talk about our finitude and mortality. What we get here is the extreme form of the gap at work already in modern science. Modern science and subjectivity aimed, aim at mastering nature. They are strictly, but they are strictly condependent with the vision of humanity as just another species on the earth. If we have to care also about the life of water and air, it means precisely that we are what Marx called universal beings, able to step outside ourselves, to, as it were, stand on our own shoulders and perceive ourselves as a minor moment of the totality of nature. In pre-modern times, when humanity perceived itself as the crown of creation, uh, this perception implied a much more modest sense. This is the paradox we have to sustain today. To accept that we are, yes, one among the species on Earth, and simultaneously to think and act as universal beings, to escape into the comfortable modesty of our finitude and mortality is not an option. It is a path to catastrophe. So you see the paradox. For me, ideology today is precisely this deep ecological stance of we are just one among the species and so on and so on. But where are those who claim this speaking from? At the same time, they occupy the general position from which they can take care of the entire uh, of the entire life on Earth. So, to conclude, I would like to deal with an event 
which is going on now and which exemplifies, I think, the corruption, sorry, the collapse of the distinction between ideological appearance and its obscene underground. From time to time, my own Slovene government does something that makes me deeply ashamed of being a citizen of my own country, Slovenia. Now, it is one of such moments. Namely, as an act of solidarity with Israel, Slovene government, together with those of Austria and the Czech Republic, decided to add to the Slovene and European flags flown in front of official buildings, also the Israeli flag. The official explanation was that Israel is under rocket attacks from Gaza and has to defend itself. No usual calls for mutual restraint, just a clear assignation of guilt. But the ongoing crisis did not begin with rockets from Gaza. It began in East Jerusalem when Israel is again trying to evict Palestinian families. The frustration of the Palestinians is easily understandable. For over 50 years from 1967 war, they are stuck on the West Bank in a kind of a limbo with no identity, refugees in their own land. The Palestinian predicament found its most desperate expression in a series of individual suicide attacks on Jews in Jerusalem a couple of years ago, mostly with knives. There was no collective movement or mind behind them, just the horror of ha having no prospect of a way out. So that's my reading of the events. Well, as a sign of solidarity with Palestinians on the West Bank, Hamas began to launch rockets against Israel. This act, which should be condemned unambiguously, served perfectly Netanyahu, a genuine desperate West Bank protest against the Israeli ethnic cleansing became yet another Hamas-Israel conflict with Israel just responding to rocket attacks. Although now Netanyahu himself had to admit that the civil unrest in Israel is a greater threat than the rockets from Gaza. One of the focal points of the protests in the Israeli city of Lod, with a strong Palestinian presence, uh, uh, provoked uh, Lot's mayor to describe events as a civil war. Gangs from both sides are terrorizing individuals, families, and stores up to direct lynchings. Uh, Far-right Jewish Israelis, often armed with guns and operating in full view of police, have moved into mixed areas. The most dangerous aspect of the situation, I think, is that the Israeli police is dropping even the pretense of acting as a neutral agent of the law and public safety. Sometimes they even applaud the Jewish mob, which terrorizes Palestinians. In short, <coughs> the rule of law is disintegrating in Israel, at least for its Palestinian citizens. They are left to themselves alone. They cannot appeal to any higher agency that would intervene when they are attacked. This scandalous situation is a consequence of something that goes on in Israel in last years. The openly racist extreme right, which wants to assert what they obscenely call Israel's full sovereignty over the West Bank and treats Palestinians who live there as unwelcome intruders, is more and more recognized as legitimate. It is becoming part of the public political discourse. This stance was, of course, all the time the unspoken de facto foundation of the Israeli politics, but it was never publicly acknowledged. It was just the secret, although known to everyone, which motivated the Israeli politics, whose public official position was always, till recently, 
the double state position, the only solution are two states, and respect for international laws and obligations. Now that this appearance of respect for the law is dissolving, it is not enough to say that we get the reality of what was all the time the truth behind the appearance. Appearances are essential. They oblige us to act in a certain way, so that without the appearance, the way we act changes also. The distance between appearance and the dark reality behind it enabled Israel to present itself as a modern state of law in contrast to the Arab religious fundamentalism. But with this public acceptance of the religious fundamentalist racism, Palestinians are now paradoxically a force of secular neutrality, while the Israelis act like religious fundamentalists. The big goal of Jewish fundamentalists is to reoccupy the mount, destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and replace it with a new temple, which stood there before the Romans, not the Arabs, destroyed it. Does this not remind us of India, where the Hindu nationalists want to destroy mosques and build there a Hindu temple? No wonder India is now in good relations with Israel. Modi is pursuing a similar ethnic homo homogenization of India against Muslim minority. The wider context of this escalation of events in Israel makes the entire picture even darker. First in France, then in the United States, a considerable group of military officers and generals published a letter warning against the threat to the national identity and the way of life of their country. In France, the letter attacks the tolerance of the state against Islamization. In the United States, they warn about the socialist and Marxist politics of the Biden administration. So the myth of the depoliticized character of the armed forces is dispelled. A considerable part of the army supports the nationalist agenda. In short, what happens now in Israel is part of a global trend. But now I come to ideology. What does this mean for the Jewish identity? As one of the Holocaust survivors said, in the past, an anti-Semite was a person who dislikes Jews. Now, an anti-Semite is a person whom Jews dislike. Which Jews? The title of a recent dialogue on anti-Semitism in the German, the weekly journal Der Spiegel was, who is an anti-Semite determines the Jew and not the potential anti-Semite. Okay, sounds logical the victim should decide of its victim status. So in the same sense that this holds for a woman who claims she was raped, it should also hold for Jews. But there are two problems here. First, should then not the same also hold for Palestinians on the West Bank who should determine who is stealing their land and depriving them of their elementary rights? And second point, who is the Jew who determines who is anti-Semite? What about quite numerous Jews who support BDS or who at least have doubts about the state of Israel politics on the West Bank? Is not the implication of the quote stands that although empirically Jews, they, these guys who oppose Israeli politics are in some deeper sense not Jews that they betrayed their Jewish identity. The Italian writer Carlo Ginzburg proposed the notion that a shame for one's country, not love of it, may be the true mark of belonging to it. A supreme example of such shame occurred back in 2014 when hundreds of Holocaust survivors and descendants of survivors bought an ad in New York Times condemning what they referred to as the massacre of Palestinians in Gaza and the ongoing occupation and 
colonization of Pakistan, to quote this letter. We are alarmed by the extreme racist dehumanization of Palestinians in Israeli society, which has reached a fever pitch, end of quote. Maybe today, some Israelis will gather the courage to feel shame apropos of what the Israelis are doing on the West Bank and in Israel itself. Not, of course, in the sense of shame for being Jewish, but on the contrary, of feeling shame for what the Israeli politics in the West Bank is doing to the most precious legacy of Judaism itself. Maybe you in India should also be a little bit ashamed of what Modi is doing, as me, I, myself, I certainly am ashamed of what my own Slovene government is doing. Thank you very much for your patience. I was jumping a little bit here and there, but I hope my basic point is clear. Don't just take ideology as what it says. Take into account its unspoken premises, its hidden racist implications, all the unwritten rules that an ideology implies and its material existence. Ideology is not just what is explicitly done. Ideology is the texture of daily life in which all this lives. For example, to really conclude, don't be afraid, I will not lose the thread. I had a fundamental experience of what ideology is when I, well, my God, it was 40 years ago, when I served the army. And uh, okay, the officially the original Yugoslav patriotism, blah, blah, blah. But then uh, what uh, did strike me is the extent to which this explicit level was sustained by secret obscenities, uh, dirty jokes, and so on and so on. You know, like uh, erotic insinuations and so on. Even, even at the level of homosexuality, people usually say the army is homophobic. Yes, but it was much more ambiguous in ex-Yugoslavia when I served the army. Explicitly, it was totally homophobic. When a soldier was discovered to be gay, he was beaten, terrorized before being thrown out of the army. But uh, uh, at the same time, I never was in a community where the everyday life was so penetrated by homosexual innuendos. You see, homophobic, but at the same time, full of, uh, uh, full of, dirty gay innuendos, like the most vulgar example I always mention. In the morning, when I met another soldier, I didn't tell him good morning, but smoke your, uh, smoke your prick, which was a vulgar way for uh, fellatio and so on. And my point is that this is ideology in its reality, not just the dignified big phrases, but the obscenities which uh, enable an ideology to actually function. I see here calls that you want to ask questions. I am very sorry if I was too long, and please, now I'm here to be attacked. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that exceedingly beautiful session. Uh, we will begin our Q&A session now. Participants are requested to post their questions in the chat box, and we will be reading them out. Okay, so shall I read out the questions, sir? Sorry? Shall I read out the questions now? No, uh, how, uh, how do we do it? Will you read them to me? Will I see them? I'll read it out to you and uh, you shall answer. Sorry, you will read them to me? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, of course. I just wanted to know because I see some questions here and it's... So I ignore what I see, I listen to your voice. To okay, put it yes, in sir. a romantic way. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the first question is from Dr. Vimal Mohanjol. The question is, if the real is ultimately virtual, how would you describe the value of cryptocurrencies? Would you call it the ultimate symbol of postmodernist exchange, especially Sorry. when seen in the... 
Sorry, I didn't yes, get sir? the second part. How would I explain the... Okay, so I'll read it out again. No, 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 just yes. after virtual. If the real is virtual, how would you explain what? Uh, would you call it the ultimate symbol of postmodernist exchange, especially when seen in the context of reality of poverty on the one hand and the equity valuation of a currency we don't even fully understand or can't regulate? The question was about cryptocurrencies. Ah, uh -huh. I see, I see, I see. Okay, I don't have a good answer to that one. A cryptocurrency and so on and so on. I just think generally that uh, don't dismiss such things as just the ultimate postmodern capitalist manipulation. Cryptocurrency, or I love them. You remember that scandal half a year ago with Wall Street bets, where obvious ordinary people uh, began to uh, invest irrationally, perturbing the entire market. I think this is not just capitalist speculation, but it's also a sign that the form of capitalism is approaching its end. Capitalism is beginning to work in an openly irrational way. I think we should return to old Marxist prediction that it's the internal immanent contradictions that will undermine uh, that will undermine capitalism. But another thing I want to also make clear: my point is not as it may appear. Uh, uh, my point is not that, uh, oh, there is no reality, it's, uh, everything is virtual, and so on and so on. No, there is social reality, facts are facts. I'm just saying that how the way we experience reality is always sustained by this uh, anonymous threat, absences that power works only uh, uh, as a potential trade in other words, words, what I claim is that our reality, what we, and that's the big lesson of Marxist theory of commodity fetishism, our reality is sustained through ideological fictions. If you take away fictions, reality itself disintegrates. That's why, interestingly, Although commodity fetishism is an ideological fiction, Marx never called it uh, ideology because it was part of the very core of economic, uh, of, uh, economic reality. And that's what I think is happening now. What we call the end of truth is rather the end of fictions. Fictions which were till now stable, structuring our reality, are disintegrating. Sorry, I don't want to lose too much of your time. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is by Babu Taliat. Uh, he asked, while ideologies in their genesis and basic principles claim a form of universalism, that is their universal existence and validity, the material existence of ideologies, seems to tactically refer to particularism, which to my mind contradicts the idea of ideology itself. How would you observe the inherent ambiguity between universal and particular in ideologies in their emergence and establishment? This is a very good question. Unfortunately, to answer it fully, you should give me another hour and a half because it touches the key notion of what Hegel called concrete universality. I'm well aware of the classical Marxist point that uh, the basic form of ideology is a particularity which masks itself as false universality. And then critique of ideology discovers the particular spin hidden in this universality. For example, I agree with this classic example, the way human rights were formulated in early liberalism, 17th century, no, sorry, 18th century and later, it was put in neutral terms, of course all human beings are free, blah, blah, blah. But it's clear that there were many, so many exceptions, you know. 
women were excluded first. The excuse was uh, because they are not fully rational. They are too prone to emotions. Blacks were excluded, children were excluded, other races were excluded, and so on and so on. But nonetheless, I think there is something liberating in this universal formulation. You know why? Because limited as they were, this early formulation of human rights, never forget that they nonetheless immediately triggered further radicalization. Already towards the end of 18th century, Mary Wollstonecraft, you remember, said, if all men are free, why not also women? Women uh, entered. Then, uh, for me, one of the key events of modern history, the Black Slave Rebellion in Haiti. Blacks joined it, and so on, and so on. So uh, I think that uh, universality can be an ideological mystification, but at the same time, it opens up the space for us to reoccupy, to make it more actually universal. Uh, 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 second thing, you remember that universality is not just a fiction, it's a reality. Universality of market. Look, we can play this multicultural in the sense of we belong to different cultures, we don't understand each other game. Through that, when an Indian merchant meets a Chinese one or a European one or an African one, even if they use the same terms because of their different cultural background, they mean different things like money, exchange, freedom do not mean the same things to us. But nonetheless, I think ultimately this is irrelevant because exchange functions, universality function, universal mar market exchange is a fact. So again, uh, and to give you the last example of the spin, you remember, I've written about it in my books, the big polemics in the United States about Black Lives Matter. How? Blacks propose the formula Black Lives Matter, then the white liberals, conservative liberals, says, why only Black matters? Do our lives not matter? The, our motto should be all lives matter. But I agree with those critics who said, if you say all lives matter, this all is not neutral. It implies the predominance of the existent ideology. But so the statement in concrete American situation of all lives matter is really potentially a white racist statement. But if you say black lives matter, Although it appears as a defense of a particular group, it is a truly universal. Why? Because if you are really for universal rights and so on, then you should focus on what today in the United States is the exemplary form of racist exploitation and domination. It is how it became a symbol, how the policemen treat the blacks. So, that's what Hegel calls concrete universality. There is a concrete case which condenses the general injustice. For example, maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me, but when I visited India a couple of years ago before going to Kochi, to Kerala, I met in New Delhi representatives of the organization of the lowest of the lowest among the untouchables. I was proud to meet them, those who clean the dry, to the dry toilets, no? And I agreed with them, you know, like they are the moment of truth. The universal formula in India is to support them, to support the most underprivileged. Not just to say generally we are all equal and so on. To see, to grasp the particular case which embodies the injustice. So this is for me as a Hegelian an absolutely crucial question. The fact that uh, uh, that uh, to search in every universal formulation for 
the hidden, privileging, for example, human freedom. It's not only the reasons that I listed why it's a biased notion of, uh, sorry, human rights, but it's also, as you Indians and others, non-Western people know very well, it's also the set of values of how human rights are implicitly defined, like with mo more, <coughs> sorry, with more, uh, with more accent on individualist freedom than on collective solidarity and so on and so on. The very form makes it Western. And uh, let me conclude, I talk too much, I know, with a wonderful lesson that I was given in China. You remember when there was the massacre on Tiananmen, the symbol in the West became one lone guy with two, with, uh, with uh, holding uh, uh, gasoline bottles or whatever in his hands, confronting a tank approaching him. But in China, I was told this was not a symbol of Tiananmen because this was for them too Western. No, this is Western meat. One long guy approaching the army, the tanks. They had other, those who were participating in Tiananmen protests. This was not their symbol. The fact that that image became the symbol is already from a Western, uh, from a Western perspective. So what we should be aware is not just, that's why I'm opposed to identity politics. Identity politics, which means to each his, her, their group identity. Yes, but you know, the white people, Western liberals play here a dirty game. They are for identity of the others and they like to humiliate themselves, you know. But in this, through this humiliation, they become a kind of a general judges, like you black can have your identity, you Native Americans can have your identity, we don't have any identity, our identity is racist, but the implicit conclusion is because we are immediately universal. We can judge who deserves what kind of identity and so on and so on. So paradoxically, I think the way to fight white Western, white racism is to say, please develop your particular identity and don't pretend to be universal, you know? The Germans should sing their stupid Bavarian, stupid pop music dances, the French, whatever they want. You know, every, we must remember this, every particular identity involves its own universality in the sense that uh, every particular culture has also in itself a specific notion of universal culture. And so that every particular conflict is at the same time a conflict of universals. There is no neutral universality. The true struggle for hegemony is the struggle for who will define universality. But these are Hegelian topics. Maybe it's not the time for it now. Thank you. Okay, sir. Uh, the next question is from Atul Peter. The question is, do you agree that believing and acceding to a relativist narrative will gradually lead to ideological oppression? In principle, yes. But you know what is happening today? That's what is shocking me, that the predominant forum today Okay, you will say fundamentalist, but I even have doubts about them. In the West is belief mixed in a strange way with non-believing. I analyzed some of Trump's speeches where, but you can see if you read Donald Trump closely, that, that's my ironic point. Are you aware that Trump is basically the ultimate postmodern relativist president? It's obviously that he doesn't believe, he's the ultimate cynical manipulator. He doesn't believe his own set of values and so on and so on. So uh, I, I am not afraid of authentic beliefs. The danger today is I think the secret disavowed beliefs of what appears to be this cynical postmodern openness Everything is relative, everything is historicist, and so on and so on. 
I, I am, I am, I think that today we don't simply have in fundamentalists too many beliefs. I think that first, many fundamentalists mask their power play with beliefs. For example, to go to Israel, the fundam so-called fundamentalist, religious Jews, uh, 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 settlers on the West Bank who appear to be fundamentalists, I doubt if many of them really believe. It's a, they are playing a postmodern game, basically, I, I think. Because, you know, once I did something very risky against Jewish, but also Islamist, Hindu, nationalists, I tried to find some, and to, as a sign of appreciation, some, I call them authentic fundamentalists. For example, I don't want to idealize them. Uh, I even did some things which people didn't like when I criticized Tibet. But the Tibetans I met, Tibetan Buddhists, they seem to me more authentic. You know why? Because I noticed immediately one thing, they didn't have this envy. False fundamentalists always envy the others. American religious fundamentalists are obsessed with what the decadent uh, atheist people are doing, fornication, sex, drugs, and so on and so on. But Tibetans don't have this problem. They say, you have your way, we have our way. They don't envy the others. And also in the United States, although they have their own problem, and my source is not only the well-known people witness or what with Harrison Ford, the Amish people, they are authentic fundamentalists. And as such, they have very good relations with, as they call them, uh, Englishmen around them. You know, so the basic rule is don't take fundamentalists directly, literally. They are also lying. They are very unsure of themselves. They are also cheating. I don't believe in this image of fanatical fundamentalists and so on and so on. I talk too much, sorry. Okay, so the next question is by, from Samitra Roy. How far has political ideology overtaken the world we live in so that truth is too difficult to arrive at socially? Uh, I, I, think, I think that, uh, you know, it depends what do you mean by truth. I, I think we should... I didn't want to go to it because it's a philosophical debate. I think we should distinguish between truth and knowledge. Yes, we live in a complex situation. Reality is more and more impenetrable and so on and so on. But truth is for me a matter of subjective position. It's not subjective in the sense of uh, relativizing it. In a certain point, you can say, I don't understand reality, but this is how I fundamentally experience my situation, especially when you are, let's say, victim of racism, of economic exploitation, and so on, and so on. And very naively, I still, in this sense, I absolutely still believe in truth. And I have some hope here. Look at the United States. Trump is, for me, Although he pretends to be a religious conservative, no, he's the ultimate cynical relativist. But look at somebody like Bernie Sanders. He is, for me, that's why I love him. Isn't he, in the way he acts, a simple old moralist? He, in simple terms, want to do justice. We may disagree with him, want to protect, wants to protect the poor, and so on, and so on. His position is, in spite of his many mistakes, I think, and so on, his position is, is uh, the true one. So I don't have time to go now into all the details, but I absolutely am not a relativist in the sense of uh, uh, we cannot get at truth and so on and so on. You know, philosophy helped us here. The fact that it's so difficult to establish truth is already in itself a deep insight into our reality. The question to be asked is what is happening with late global capitalism that it precisely, that's the paradox of today's situation. On the one hand, 
capitalism is global, universal, but at the same time that it is universal reign of market and so on, the global public space is disappearing. So this coexistence of globalism with the disappearing of authentic universal public space, not only between the countries, but inside a country. Look at United States. You have now even more, but basically two worlds there. Liberal democratic world, which should also be criticized, and this new populist world. I don't think any reconciliation is possible there, like we are all Americans and so on. This is already ideological civil war. These are two different worlds. But again, we should analyze the situation which brought us into this. And to admit this, this split in our existence, this impossibility to arrive at a global truth is already in itself a deep insight into our situation. Okay, sir. So, um, the next question is from Francis Kuriakos. Some subjective realities are ethically preferable over others in construction of historical narratives. How do we determine the ethical criteria? There are no objective criteria. Here, I am not a relativist. There are no objective criteria because precisely this position of being outside, having an objective view is impossible. But nonetheless, wait a minute, I'm here a Hegelian Marxist. By saying subjective, for me, it's not simply relativist. For example, we may criticize Marx, but his idea of proletarians as the agent of revolution is that Marxism doesn't say we are a neutral view of history. For Marx, you can see universal historical truth only from the proletarian standpoint. Subjectivity and uh, universality are not exclusive. Why? Because we are not here societies out there. Our subjectivity is part of social reality. So now I would have to go much longer into this Hegelian Marxist topic, but that's the key insight actual more than ever of Marxism for me. That again, sub uh, uh, subjective engagement is the only way to universal truth. The so-called objective stance, I don't want to take sides, I just objectively ob observe what goes on, already implies a certain subjective position, which is not that of truth, but that of social distance, manipulation, domination, and so on and so on. Um, so please ask, Adira, please ask uh, Professor Caesar how much time he has left to answer questions. Oh, oh my God, Let, let's, uh, I'm, as you can see, I'm slowly can beginning. Decide collapse. Let's keep yeah. it to some five minutes more if it's not too oh, much for you. Maybe one more question then, Adria. Just take one more question. Okay. 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 So, so uh, Naveen Kevin asked, Ghat Saad, in his book, The Parasitic Mind, likens postmodernism to be a form of intellectual terrorism, even asserting that post-structuralist French thinkers were merely espousing nonsense, preying on parasitic hosts, mind of young graduate students, how would you compare this narrative? Sorry, sorry, who is, I didn't get just the beginning. Who, who is uh, this? Saad, the parasitic mind, God Saad. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, first, uh, let me say something, which I always have to repeat and so on and so on. All my career, under quotation marks, from my first internationally known book, Sublime Object of Ideology, is aimed against uh, this postmodern Michel Foucault-style historicist relativism. I, although I'm often characterized as a postmodern relativist, I do not consider myself absolutely not a postmodern relativist. But my answer, so, uh, although, uh, you know, uh, 
But nonetheless, I must say something in defense of this postmodern relativism, historicism. For example, two decades or three ago, some liberals attacked postmodernism as leading to justification even of Holocaust. They said if everything is a discursive, contra, uh, discursive construct, then you probably will say that Holocaust also didn't exist. It is just our discursive contract, uh, construct, everything is relative, and so on and so on. Ha ha, here I have a good answer. Sorry to tell you, but I, out of pure disgust, mixed with perverted pleasure, I read some this Holocaust deniers uh, who claim, who try to deny or at least limit Holocaust, David Irving and some others. And let me tell you something, not one of them argues in postmodern historicist way, at least rhetorically, they all argue in the good old fashioned British empiricist ways. Like David Irving says, you claim they burned so many Jews in Auschwitz. Okay, I go there, I measure the gas chambers and I say, even if they did all the time burn uh, uh, the Jews, uh, they couldn't have burned more than 200,000 and so on and so on. Of course, it's a lie, but the style is absolutely that of British empiricist factual, think factual thinking. So uh, uh, on the other hand, what precisely in this case, intelligent postmodernists make us aware to is that when we are dealing with things as horrible as Holocaust, we encounter the limit of our experience. Is some reality, Holocaust, which is so traumatic that we cannot integrate it truly. We can talk about it rationally, but we cannot really integrate it into our daily life and its ordinary reality. <coughs> For example, <coughs> sorry, we read about torture, we reports and so on. We rationally understand them, but I often ask myself, if I were to, not if I were submitted to it, that I cannot even think about, but if I were just to be present when another person is really brutally tortured, I don't think how, know how I would survive it. You know, would I break down? Would I be able to return to normal daily life? Or maybe I would try to compartment my experience, like this is my reality, it's there. That's how I think uh, we in the so-called developed West relate to news on TV. Yes, we, he we see all the images now from Gaza, Israel, whatever, Somalia starving and so on. But we silently de-realize it. It's out there on the screen. It's not part of our reality. So reality is not simply what is out there. Reality is, uh, no, I'm not a relativist. There is some Lacanians, we would call it real, things they are out there. But what we experience as reality must fit certain coordinates. If you see something too traumatic, you cannot accept it as part of your reality. Thank you, sir. We do have lots of questions in the chat box. So okay, one more, I... one more. Okay, one more. Okay, sure. One more. <laughs> Sorry, but then I just go One ahead. second, sir. Um, okay, so this question is from uh, Joe Thomas. Your opinion on the filing of the Supreme Court in a democracy with judges aligning with the ideology of the prevailing governments? It's again, it's for me, uh, uh, part of a concrete struggle. I'm not a relativist, but I would say here, it depends on who predominates the Supreme Court. It can be, uh, so uh, I don't 
I don't fetishize Supreme Court into a neutral agency. It's also a space for political struggle for me. For example, it happened in the United States already in 1930s, no, when President Roosevelt knew that he has to replace members of the Supreme Court to get things done. And th this is always the big battle in the, uh, in the United States. But I, uh, I, I think that it's typical that today this question is becoming important. Why? Because the idea of a Supreme Court is that outside our daily political struggles, there are some basic values or notions, practices that we should all respect. And they should be, so the Supreme Court shouldn't be reduced to instrument of certain politics, but just refer to some basic values shared by all. And in the United States for long years, this was the case. I'm not saying this universality embodied in a Supreme Court was a good one. Of course, it was political and so on, but it was silently accepted by all. Today, this idea of a neutral values which we should all share is undermined, is undermined. And that's the problem because, you know, in order to have a functioning democracy, all sides has to participate in a certain set of values. And no, I'm not talking about some deep ethical values, often also just procedural values. For example, you remember when Al Gore lost to Bush, it was just a question of, I don't know, 100 votes in Florida. But the rule was, you can protest as much as you want, but once the numbers are here, we all respect the result. Trump broke this. And this is the problem when, you know, conflicts are no longer conflicts against the background of shared values, but they directly in involve the basic values themselves. And here, well, how do you say, Houston, we have a problem or what? We have a problem here. Thank you, sir. We will wind up our Q&A session now. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful really to you and I'm sad. Let's, if things get better, let's, uh, let's, uh, well, let's maybe, do this again when I recompose myself and so on, no? Later maybe, because I really enjoyed it and I'm just sorry that in these crazy times, my limit, physical limit is like what we have now, one hour and a half, a little bit more, you know? Then I begin to get nervous, collapse. You know, I'm also old and so on, and uh, I was 72 and so on, and. You know, how can you see that I'm getting old? I caught myself a couple of times driving a car with friends, not me, they were driving. I guess you can see I'm a nervous wreck. I cannot drive the car. And when we pass a, a graveyard, I always ask, oh, it looks nice, this graveyard. What's the price of a grave there? And so on, as if I'm already looking at myself in that perspective. I just hope really that India will pull. India is now, as they say, as we say, the victim of two viruses, no? Literal virus and the ideological virus of certain ideology. I wish you all the best in getting rid of both viruses. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay, so I please, leave you now. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Uh, hello, you speak now. No. Hello? Yeah, but go ahead. Go ahead. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay. So we have reached the closing of the event, and I gladly invite Mr. Amal Thoms, the convener of Centenary Special Talk, to deliver the water. Thanks. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. I really miss him <laughs> right now. Anyway, most distinguished speaker of the day. Am I audible? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, you. Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, on his behalf, Professor Slavoj Zizek, honorable dignitaries, 
respected principal father Reggie Picurian, vice principals Dr. Benny Matthew and Reverend Dr. Jos George, head of the department PJ Thomas, secondary programs general coordinator Professor Joseph Job, respected faculty members, teachers, research scholars, beloved students of SP College and my dear participants. Warm greetings to you all from the Department of English and I deem it an honor to address this eclectic intellectual gathering and propose a vote of thanks. So first I would like to propose a hearty vote of thanks to the resource person uh, who unfortunately left the meeting, Professor Zizek for gracing today's session with such a thought-provoking lecture on the topic, the material existence of ideology. Having authored many works centered on the study of ideology, his ample explanation on how ideologies function and structure our social reality both consciously and unconsciously was truly stirring. He took us closer to the idea of the ideological unconscious, explaining how it is deeply ingrained within an individual and is often materialized in ways totally unknown to the performer. It is indeed a pleasure to lose oneself in the vivacious declamation of Rose Zizek, one of the most charming and scintillating intellectuals of the present era. And today he did throw some light into the ideologies, hidden and implicit negotiations of the public space. So I hope we will get another chance to meet him very soon. So on behalf of the Buckman's community and all gathered here, I thank Sir for being here, for answering our queries and for that fantabulous session. Also, I take this opportunity to thank our principal, Reverend Father Reggie P. Kurian, who besides his rigorous schedule found time to address this gathering. He has been a constant support for us since the conception of the very idea of this special talk. We thank you, Father, for the felicitation. Also, I thank the Vice Principals, Dr. Benny Matthew, Reverend Dr. Jos George, and the Centenary Programs Coordinator, Professor Joseph Joe, for their inspiration and valuable suggestion. And our beloved Head of the Department, Professor P.J. Thomas, richly deserves our gratitude for his relentless support and guidance throughout the program. He, as we all know, he toiled around the clock did all the heavy lifting and only with the organizing team. So I thank you, sir, for your generosity and all the hard work you have put in. I also thank all the dignitaries, former teachers and head of the departments from various institutions for their kind presence throughout. Also, I'm grateful to Professor Vipin Charyan, Dr. Vimal Mohan John, Reverend Dr. Binni Matthew and Professor Anish Joseph, who work behind the curtains, managing the Q&A session exceptionally well. And I thank Professor Jaren B. Sebastian Mr. Dan of 3rd BA Vocational English, Celine of 1st BA Vocational English, and Mr. Tojo Sebastian for their technical assistance and my gratitude extends to 1st MA students Adira and Anna for meticulously moderating the session. I also register my indebtedness to the faculty members who have directly or indirectly helped me. Finally, all those wonderful participants who have managed to spare some time with us and participated so actively in this session besides this raging pandemic. We have here over uh, 1,300 participants attending the program on both Zoom and YouTube. Students, teachers, research scholars from various parts of the globe, and also participants from various known academic fields. I take this opportunity to thank every one of them. Once again, I thank you all for your cordial cooperation. Hoping to meet you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have come to the end of our session. Uh, thank you all once again for joining us. Have a day with us, sir. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.